um, series or the first in the series of the horse management seminar for 2022. As I'm scrolling through all of our attendees' names, a lot of you look very familiar. So I'm sure you've been on some more of either my webinars or maybe you were here last year for our, our first virtual horse management seminar. Um, if you are new to uh, the Rutgers University Horse Management Seminar or any webinar series, again, welcome. I am Dr. Kerry Williams. I'm the Equine Extension Specialist at Rutgers University. I've been here now uh, going on, well, this July will be 19 years. So um, I, I know some of you uh, very well through a lot of my programs. And we are still muddling through um, the, the, I guess we can almost say post-pandemic era. However, because Rutgers has placed a lot of restrictions on what we do face-to-face, -face, I decided we're going to virtual one more year. Um, they were so successful last year. I'm actually looking at my notes from last year. We had over 200 attendees almost every single day so, uh, of, the, of the series. So we're hoping to continue that. And I see, like I said, our numbers are still climbing. So we just might get there this time too. Um, so we decided to, to try it again. And we've got six speakers throughout the next uh, three days of, of webinars. So again, thank you for joining. So uh, my employer um, has partnered with, and I am actually the Associate Director for Extension at the Rutgers Equine Science Center. And instead of me talking about what we do at the Equine Science Center, um, we have a nice little video that I actually would love to share with all of you. Good morning. Welcome to the George H. Cook campus home of the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station, the School of Environmental Biological Sciences, and of course, home to the Rutgers Equine Science Center. The Equine Science Center is a soft-walled center where we bring together the best and the brightest to solve challenges impacting horses, horse well-being, and the horse industry. To provide you more details about the research being conducted at the Equine Science Center and specifically the Equine Exercise Physiology Lab, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kenneth McKeever. The lab was founded in 1995 and since then it's been one of the most productive um, research labs in the country, if not the world. We've conducted studies looking at how to care for the aged horse, that's a horse that's over 20. We've looked at various drugs that affect performance. We've even done studies for the Army looking at food extracts that can reduce inflammation. So the Equine Science Center and the Equine Exercise Physiology Lab are a valuable asset to how we care for horses in the state of New Jersey. So you've all visited this morning the Equine Exercise Physiology Lab, part of the Equine Science Center at Rutgers. We have another facility where cutting edge research is being carried out, located on Riders Lane, and it is the site of the first of its kind environmental best management practices demonstration horse farm, located here on the George H. Cook campus. The team of scientists who are helping horse farmers become better environmental stewards and caretakers of the land is a team of multidisciplinary faculty, students, and staff, led by Dr. Carrie Williams. Dr. Mike Westendorf, PhD student Jennifer Weinart, and other faculty, students, and staff from different departments here at Rutgers and beyond. Hello, I'm Dr. Carrie Williams, the Equine Extension Specialist here at Rutgers University and the Associate Director of Extension for the Equine Science Center. We are here at the Environmental Best Management Practice Demonstration Horse Farm. This serves as a wonderful venue for the public farm owners, other industry professionals, to come look and see the eight various best management practices, educational venues that they can use on their farm or in their areas. It is open to the public, you can come anytime. This venue also serves as a great location for research. My current graduate student, Jennifer Weinart, is looking at both cool season and some novel warm season grasses to see the production as well as the horse's metabolism. Some glucose and insulin responses as well as the microbiome will be looked at over the next two years of this project. Thank you for visiting all of us at the Equine Science Center. Our website can be found at ESC 
www.rutgers.edu. So the next thing I want to do, actually, now that you know a little bit about us, I want to know a little bit of you. So here's what we're going to do. I would like everybody to go, and I'm going to put this in the chat box. Everybody go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And you can do that on your smartphone. You can do that, open another window and do it another window on your computer. Um, but menti.com is going to we're going to do two poll questions and it's just going to give me an idea of how many people are out there and uh, and where you're coming from. And it really helps the speakers as well kind of your audiences. So I'm uh, giving you a little bit of time, but just make sure everybody pulls up Menti. And then when you go to menti.com, you are going to enter some digits and the digits you're going to enter are going to be eight. Four eight five oh nine one three, and I'm going to put it on the screen in just a minute. There we are. So when everybody gets a chance, go to menti.com, and then you'll see at the top um, that it is eight four eight five. Oops, and I think I need to actually share my other screen. There we go. There we go. Now you should see it. Menti.com. Eight four eight five zero oh, nine one three. Yeah. So I see everybody starting to get in there. Um, first, I want to know what state or. Um, so just do the state or just do the country, not both. Yeah. And the reason why I say this is because the more people from Eight, the bigger the word is going to get. So I love watching the words change on the screen. Right now, New Jersey's winning, which, you know, is about right. That's usually what happens. You kind of are off on another side. So I see NJ a couple times. But just type in the full state or the full country. And the reason why I say country is because we global, a lot of times we actually get people from other countries. Like right now, I see there's um, Mexico on there, which is great. I see Mexico. Um, I don't know if I can. It's changing so fast. I'm almost getting lost. Um, but New Jersey and are close one and two. Um, but we have, we've got quite a few uh, all over uh, the state. Oh, I see Scotland. Excellent. So there's another country. Um, I see. So if anyone's out there, and I'm going to leave this up for just a little bit. Now I see we have 100 attendees logged on to Menti. And I'm going to type this in again. So right now we are at menti.com for anybody who's coming in early. And then you can go to 848501913913. There we go. For those of you who are just logging in early. So go ahead and put this in Menti. Where you from? What state? or country and just uh, go ahead and, and put that in there till I start seeing things slow down and then we're gonna go to the next slide. So right now, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, you know, a lot of our clients that have gotten the advertisements in these two areas, but I'm also seeing now Peru and Brazil. Excellent, welcome, thank you for joining us. And like I said, I had seen Mexico before along with Scotland, seeing if I see any more. Far away state, Alaska. Welcome, Alaska. I think that, that's most of them. We're starting to slow down just a little bit. So I'll go on to the next one, but welcome everybody. Thanks for doing that. Um, so our next slide is asking us, what is your the courses? Um, I let you answer more than one thing. You know, if you're, uh, you're uh, teach lessons, but also manage a bar and you can click on both of those. Um, but really kind of what's your primary thing? Are you primarily a horse owner? Um, if you don't own a horse, but love them, you might be a horse enthusiast. Um, you know, trainers, you give a trainer, you train horses, do you give lessons? Um, what about a barn manager that's on there? And then uh, kind of have a list of any other industry professionals. So like feed, tech, pharmaceutical, um, et cetera. Um, veterinarians, even have a couple of veterinarians out there. Welcome and thank you. 
And then uh, anything other and other, if you would like to put in the chat box for us as a host, um, we'll be able to see what other professions you might be. Um, and I know I see, um, see that there's some uh, horse boarding, breeding, training. I see also my microphone isn't working well, which is about par for the course, but that's okay. I'm not the important speaker tonight. So <laughs> we'll get we'll get someone else. Mounted patrol, excellent, welcome there. Um, and a lot of boarding. So thank you for introducing yourselves. That gives us a really nice um, overview of the audience that we're, we're talking to. We got more path instructors, um, certified acupressure uh, teachers, excellent. Well, I'll leave this um, leave this go. I won't turn it off yet if you want to keep answering, but um, I will stop sharing um, that screen for a minute because I've got some other things for us to do. And I'm also going to go switch the microphone again because that always seems to be the problem. So here are all uh, things going forward before I introduce our first speaker. So. Um, First, what I want to say is, while I know everybody's talking in the chat box right now, and that's great, but what's going to happen in a little bit is we're actually going to not be using the chat box. So please, if you have a question for our speakers, I would much prefer that you put them in the Q&A. So there's down at the bottom of the screen, along with the chat, you'll actually see a bunch of other buttons, and one of them is Q&A. And the reason why we're doing Q&A is because you know, there's close to 100 attendees on here and the chat is going to get lost very quickly. So we won't be able to really look through the chat and do monitor all the questions. But yet in the Q&A, it's much easier to monitor them for both myself and, and those that are helping me monitor the questions. So we would really ask you if you do have an important question for the speaker, it'll be answered during our Q&A panel at the very end of the evening. Um, but go ahead and ask that in the Q&A box. Um, and then we'll go ahead and, and get to that as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna read a short little bio about our first speaker, Dr. Mark Christman. And then I'm gonna play just a, a short little video clip before I let him turn it or take it away and uh, tell us everything he's gonna talk to us about today. Received his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in 1984 from the University of Warsaw, Poland. He completed an internship and residency in 1987 at Washington State University and large animal internal medicine. And then he became a dip equine internal medicine in 1990 from uh, in 1990. And then from 97 to 2010, he served as faculty of the Virginia, Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine, where he was large animal, clinic, uh, large animal clinical sciences. And I will say, this is the first time that I actually met Dr. Christman. He might not remember me because I was a lowly little graduate student in the Department of Animal Science, but I did some work and uh, took some classes and heard some of his lectures um, over at the, the vet school, which is on the Virginia Tech campus. Um, he authored over 85 referee publications and uh, book chapters, and recently has joined Zoetis as their senior veterinarian in July of 2010. He has joined the board for the Horses and Humans Research Foundation more recently in 2020. So, all are not uh, uh, really associated with uh, with. Uh, universities, but uh, veterinary practices, I asked them if they would like to share a video um, about something that they do or what they work for. So we're going to just take a short little uh, snippet of time and watch this brief little video that Dr. Christman sent me um, from Zoetis. So let me go ahead and share my screen and pull that up. Okay. Come on. Hey, Mom. Just checking in. Hope you're doing okay. Have you seen 
Text. I'll go find him. Well, that's right, and his eyes. Oh. You see his eyelashes, too? Today we did fractions. It was really fun. I like fractions. But you said you were concerned about some things? Well, she's just moving real slow. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, I that video was is basically what Zoetis is all about. And I've seen that video about 20 times and every time I get a little tear in my eye. So it's a very effective, it's a very effective piece. So what I wanna do over the next 40 minutes is go over some studies that we've done um, uh, this, primarily, this, these studies have uh, have been sponsored by Zoetis. Uh, so I'm going to go over and hopefully I'll be able to get through the majority of them. And if we get shut off, then uh, we'll carry on. Um, so the first uh, the first study I'm going to go over is uh, a study that we did looking at uh, effective vaccination strategies and specifically related to Potomac horse fever. Uh, so uh, we completed this study a couple of years ago, probably two years ago, it was published. Um, and the title is a little bit confusing. The title is Immunogenicity of Potomac Horse Fever Vaccine When Simultaneously Co-Administered with a Rabies Vaccine in a Multivalent, which is two antigens, or uh, as two separate monovalent vaccines. And I'll explain that a little bit more. But the, the genesis of this particular study is that Potomac horse fever is a big problem. Uh, and we know that the vaccine has been around for probably over 30 years now. Uh, and it's the vaccine is not very good. Part of the problem is, is that the organism, the neorickettsial, organism has actually uh, mutated and it's it's a different it's different now is kind of like the covid story they keep uh, mutating so the reason we did this study is there are there are two different vaccines currently on the market one is what we call a monovalent potomac horse fever uh, and that just contains a single antigen the other one that's very popular it's a combination. It contains both the Potomac horse fever vaccine or antigen and rabies together. And one of the things we've noted over the last several years is this concept of antigen interference. So when you get too many uh, antigens or antigens that compete with one another, uh, they reduce the effectiveness of one or both of the constituents. So essentially we wanted to see, check the response uh, of horses that were vaccinated. So for this study, and now it's not trying to change again. Um, okay, uh, so what we did, we had 91 client uh, univers and university owned horses that were in this study. Uh, essentially these, uh, these titers, we, 45, of the, 45 of the horses received the monovalent or the two vaccines, the rabies and the Potomac horse fever at the same time at different sites on the neck. Okay, so they received two monovalent vaccines 
The other 46 horses contain the multivalent vaccine, which was both the rabies and the monovalent given in the, the Potomac horse fever given in the same syringe. So we pulled titers for all these horses in December. Uh, they were assigned to their groups uh, of either the, the uh, multivalent or the monovalent vaccines. And um, then we pulled titers January, February, and March. Uh, so, and the reason we chose these months is those were the least likely months for these horses to be exposed to the organism during those cold winter months. So, um, so that's basically how the, the study was set up. It was a very straightforward design. We had epidemiologists and statisticians on this. So they were watching us the whole time. So essentially what happened, uh, and you can see on the X axis, the one, two, and three, those correspond to the three months. So January, number one is January or one month after they were vaccinated two is February and three is March. And that kind of orangish putrid color on the left uh, is the titer of the, the Potomac horse fever titer um, or the percentage of horses that zero converted for Potomac horse fever. And you can see it's just barely over 20% as opposed to the monovalent, the horses that just received just the, um, um, just the Potomac horse fever and the rabies in, in two separate syringes, uh, they approach 45% zero converted. Uh, at two months of age, you can see there's still a statistical difference there uh, where the monovalent group were still quite uh, good. And then when we get out to three months of age, uh, you can see where there, we're, we're losing some of our uh, immunogenicity or some of our ability to maintain a, a robust titer. So uh, this basically this shows uh, essentially the real numbers. Uh, I don't need to go over all those, but essentially the monovalent PHF vaccine was significantly greater immunogenicity uh, in terms of its uh, its titers. So after when we get out to about three months of age there really is uh, no significant difference. So you've essentially got just a couple of months of good protection. Uh, and then we get down to, down to getting back to baseline levels again. So this is just another graphic representation. And you can see the titers on the y-axis. One in this case is December. So that's their titers before they were vaccinated. Two is January, three is February. And you can see four is March where they're getting back to baseline. But this probably more accurately depicts uh, that the horses that got the combination vaccine, the rabies PHF together, uh, really didn't respond uh, very well at all. So this is a classic example of what I referred to previously as antigen interference. Those two Potomac horse fever and rabies did not play well in the same syringe. Uh, now I will just add as a side note here, we did check rabies titers on some of these horses and the rabies titers were fine. So it didn't affect their rabies titers, but it definitely, the rabies definitely affected the, the Potomac horse fever. So the conclusion of this particular study was that number one, we know that the Potomac horse fever vaccine is not a very robust vaccine at all. And there are lots of reports out there that have confirmed this. Uh, the response is weaker uh, when the PHF vaccine is administered with rabies together in the same syringe. Now, when they're administered separately, no problem. But when they're in the same syringe, it doesn't play well. Uh, we didn't investigate that particular mechanism, but we looked at it and we noticed it in other vaccines too. Um, the study did suggest that to maximize your response to Potomac horse fever, that you should administer it as a monovalent or as a single vaccine. And the other thing that we, we suggest, and I know a lot of people will come out and you know they want their veterinarian to give them their spring shots. Uh, they may elect uh, to get their Potomac horse fever in the spring, but this study demonstrated that by three months, they're essentially back down to where they started. 
So the current recommendations are to vaccinate your horse with the monovalent in the late spring um, as its primary dose. And that will get you through, do you vaccinate late spring, like uh, April, May, and then booster again in August, because most of the PHF cases that we see are typically uh, late summer through the fall. So give the booster again in August, and that will give you your best chance of, of some protection in this particular case. Um, so, uh, so I hope that was clear. I'm gonna go through that quickly. Um, we have Potomac horse fever. I don't know if any of you have actually had a horse that has gotten PHF, but it is a very unpleasant and sometimes fatal disease. So we don't like it. Um, now this next study, this is really interesting. This just came out uh, in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, which is a really good journal. It was done at Texas A&M with a really high-end group of researchers. Uh, Dr. Whitfield Cargill is a really uh, very accomplished researcher. Uh, Noah Cohen on there is a really good friend of mine. Again, this whole group at A&M does really, really top shelf research. And the title of this particular paper was the effects of phenylbutazone alone or in combination with a nutritional therapeutic uh, on the, the effects, some of the side effects that we see from uh, giving phenylbutazone like gastric ulcers, intestinal permeability and alterations in the fecal, fecal microbiota. Um, so I, I will be honest with you, I have a lot of these nutritional supplements, I'm, I, I have to scratch my head because sometimes the science coming out is somewhere between dubious, skeptical, I don't, I don't know the word, some of it's very good, but sometimes the science uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, but the way this study was conducted was just outstanding. And that's the only thing I can, I can really highlight here. So the objective was to determine whether phenylbutazone affected the gut barrier function, uh, if there was GI injury, specifically ulcers, and if any of these changes could be ameliorated by a nutritional therapeutic. Uh, and in this case, the nutritional therapeutic, I will tell you, was platinum performance. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with platinum performance. Uh, I will, in full disclosure, Zoetis recently purchased that company. And I, quite honestly, they purchased it because of all the science that's behind it. Uh, so this study was essentially, it was a block randomized uh, design. So all horses were managed uh, identically throughout the study. There were 30 adult horses in this study. So there were uh, basically uh, three groups of 10 horses each. The horses were brought onto the farm. They had a 14 day acclimation period. They were all fed the same hay at coastal Bermuda. Uh, they were all managed and handled exactly the same. Then they had what they called a 50 day pretreatment period. And in that period, the horses that were on the nutritional supplement um, were given the supplement just alone. So it was 147 grams, which is about five ounces in a bucket one time a day. It was recorded how much they ate, if all of it, but if it was essentially just a handful of platinum performance, five ounces, it was very carefully measured. Um, and uh, that was during the 50 day pre-treatment period. And in, but they were brought in from the pasture, given their little handful of the, the supplement and then turned back out with the rest of the group. After 50 days, there was a nine day treatment period. That nine day treatment period, uh, 10 of the horses got 4.4 mg per keg of phenylbutazone, uh, which is a couple grams once a day in a paste, an oral paste. Uh, the other group, the nutritional supplement group got their supplement still, but had what we call the carrier. So there was no butanate, it was just an empty, it was just, a, a gel that had no therapeutic effect. And then there was a 10 day post-treatment follow-up period. And all during this time they did, they did gastroscopy on the stomach, they did physical exams, they did TPR, scoping weight, they collected feces, uh, ultrasound, uh, the right dorsal colon. So it was a very, very thorough 
uh, examination that they did on all these horses. So I'm not gonna go through all these different plots, but one of the things interestingly that they measured was 16 S uh, RDNA. And, and essentially what that is, is, is a marker of gut permeability. Uh, so what they saw in this particular study was the middle group on this graph on the left, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, was the phenylbutazone group. So on the left side is just the controls, and you can see that there was essentially no change in their circulating uh, 16S. The phenylbutazone group, right about in the middle of that treatment period, had a big spike. And what that means is that there was increased gut permeability. So microbes were basically escaping that gut mucosal barrier. That's not a good thing. Uh, but you can see in the group on the right, uh, which is the phenylbutazone plus the nutritional supplement, no change. Uh, the second one on the right, uh, the second uh, whisker plot is essentially looking at ulcers for, from the gastroscopy. And you can see again, the control group, no changes. The group all the way on the right, the nutritional supplements with the but, no changes. But the butte group, they had ulcers. So that's again, uh, to be expected at some level. So just briefly, the results of this were that again, in both the control group and the phenylbutazone group, uh, there was a decrease in body weight, which I found really interesting. Uh, there was in the control group, they lost about 23 kilograms. The butte group lost about 36 kilograms. Um, and uh, they, in the group that got the nutritional supplement, no loss. They actually gained a little bit of weight, surprisingly. Uh, the ulcer score, as expected, there was no change in the, in the control or the nutritional supplement group. Uh, and there was, a, as I mentioned, this 16S uh, RDNA, which is a measure of gut permeability, uh, was significantly higher in the group that got the phenylbutazone. So the conclusions were, from this particular study was that but phenylbutazone resulted in an increase in GI permeability, as I mentioned, transient bacterial translocation, that's the 16 SR DNA, gastric ulcers, and I didn't go into this, but there was a disruption or an alter alterations in the fecal microbiota. Uh, so these effects were pre prevented or attenuated by feeding this nutritional supplement. Uh, again, the exact mechanism, we don't really know, but this is something that's going to be investigated further. So the bottom line is this was a really helpful study. It was really well done, well designed, well executed. And it's a study that convinced me that yes, this platinum performance, this nutritional supplement did indeed help these horses. So just as a side note, um, and I'm guessing there are a fair number of you, since I can't see hands, uh, of how many folks out there use ulcer guard or gastric guard, or what we call this class of drug, or the, what we call these proton pump inhibitors. Um, and they've noticed this for a long time, but these, uh, Dr. Sykes, who did his residency with us up at Marion DuPont, uh, basically, has been looking at this for quite a while, uh, looking at the chronic effect of gastroguard and ulcer guard. Now, I wanna make it clear, if you have your horse that's injured or are gonna be on butte for a while, it's fine to put them on, a, 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 again, a, a gastroprotectant or a proton pump inhibitor for a week or so. Uh, but there are a lot of horses on the racetrack, for example, or horses that are in heavy competition that are predisposed to ulcers, and they're on the drug chronically. And what they found from a lot of these studies, and I will tell you many of these studies have come from the human side of the equation, but uh, we do see things like with long-term administration of omeprazole or ulcer guard, gastro guard, we see things like rebound gastric hyperacidity. Uh, we do know that it does, these drugs do affect the gut microbiota. Uh, another thing that we see is that uh, when we have a concurrent administration of gastroguard or these uh, omeprazole and non-steroidals, 
uh, that we do see an increase in GI toxicity. Another really interesting thing that we that we've noticed this for a long time on humans, and to my knowledge, nobody's looked at this in horses. Uh, but these these uh, omeprazole, these proton pump inhibitors, interfere with calcium metabolism. And in humans that are on chronically on these drugs, they see an increased risk of fracture. Nobody's looked at that in horses, and I think that's something that needs to be investigated. Uh, and the other thing is over time, chronic administration of these drugs, they do uh, build up a, a kind of resistance to it. So it's basically the metabolism increases. So the moral of the story is the proton pump inhibitors have been a godsend for preventing ulcers, but like anything used too much, used too long, it's going to have negative effects. On the other side is this is a case in point where these uh, nutritional supplement, in this case, platinum performance was truly helpful in preventing a lot of those changes in horses. So enough of that study. Uh, now I'm doing this reluctantly, but I wanna get a little bit into Lyme disease because Dr. Williams said that they really wanted to hear some on Lyme disease. And I'm gonna admit right up front, I do not have all the answers. Uh, I have a lot of questions. And there is a lot of myth and a lot of rumor and speculation out there. Uh, so I'm going to go through bits of this very quickly. Uh, and I'll get into the guts of it here in a second. But basically, the organ, it's called, uh, it's caused by Lyme disease, is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. The disease was first uh, observed in the U.S. in 76, Lyme, Connecticut. And please please don't put an S on the end of it. It's Lyme disease, not Lyme's disease. That gets people in Connecticut very upset. Uh, so it's very common in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Great Lakes, and now we are seeing it all across the United States. Tick is the vector. Uh, the bacteria is not free living. It's a gram negative extracellular spirochete. Those are nasty little organisms. Uh, the white-footed mouse is the source of all evil in this particular case. Deer are involved, but they do not get the disease and they do not carry the disease. They are simply amplifiers or uh, essentially they help maintain the life cycle of these ticks, uh, but they don't, like I said, they, for, they don't get it and they, are not, they don't transmit it, but they do amplify or help the, uh, the tick continue on its two-year life cycle. So, um, so basically, um, uh, again, we know that there, are, there have been multiple serologic uh, or seroprevalence studies that have been done uh, across the United States. Uh, we did one here, it's probably six years ago uh, in Southwest Virginia. And we found that 33% uh, of the horses were, were seropositive. Uh, another study that was done in New England, 45%. And these were all done several, well, you can see the New England one was done in 2000. Um, so they've done, been done all across the country, but there haven't been any done really in the last two or three years. Uh, the current estimates on the human side, and this is coming from the CDC, is that there are about 476,000 Lyme cases reported in the US every year and another 85,000 in Europe every year. So this is a very prevalent disease. Um, uh, Meta-analysis and comprehensive nationwide studies have not been performed on horses to date. So there's lots of regional studies, but nonetheless, we know it's out there and uh, we know it's a problem. So essentially, it's a two-year life cycle. Uh, the, the seed ticks, uh, it's the larva, the nymph to the adult, um, and they feed on the, the white-footed or the forest mouse, uh, and that's where they pick the spirochete up, the, the Borrelia organism up. Uh, it takes that tick about, once it attaches to a host, so human, horse, dog, uh, Typically, they have to be attached for 24 to 48 hours. So I just rounded to say 36 hours. If you've got a tick on you for 36 hours and that tick does harbor the organism, 
you probably got it. Uh, there are certain genes in the tick that allow for transmission and survival in different hosts. And like I said, it's a, it's a two year life cycle from the eggs to the larvae. You can see that little graph or the little chart down below to the nymphs. Um, and then uh, again, the seed ticks or the larvae and the nymphs are basically they're the size of a pencil lead. It's very difficult to see them. Um, but the adults, again, during their uh, year and a half, they mate, they lay eggs and the whole situation starts again. So we know they're out there and we, we, oops, sorry, we know it's a problem. So, uh, so the clinical signs, and this is a big problem. They are very, very nonspecific. Uh, again, we hear things like weight loss, muscle, muscle wasting over the top line, uh, shifting lamenesses, uh, stiffness, muscle soreness, Swollen joints have also been uh, have been noted. Laminitis has been reported, but there again, I, I I'm not buying that one. I don't know if I've specifically seen or heard of any cases that were definitively diagnosed with Borrelia and coming down with laminitis. Lethargy. These are all, like I said, very non-specific. Now, uveitis, wound blindness. That one we absolutely know that again, most of the uveitis is caused primarily by leptospirosis or leptospiremia, leptospirosis. Uh, but again, we have isolated the organism from the eyes of horses that have uveitis. Uh, the, neuro, the neurologic sign, the neuroborreliosis is also uh, absolutely uh, associated, can be associated with um, uh, with Borrelia, with the organism. And that also has been noted. They've done some really nice work at Penn and Cornell looking at this. Uh, the problem is that the clinical signs look like EPM, look like Wobbler syndrome. It's, there's a whole host of other things that fit in there, but definitely you have to have uh, the Borrelia or the Lyme disease on there. Abortion, uh, I think that's been uh, reported a couple times. And then finally, this skin or the nodular lesions, uh, we have seen that, and that has also been associated with, uh, with Borrelia, with Lyme disease. So again, those three different clinical syndromes uh, that I just mentioned, the neuroborreliosis, the uveitis, and the cutaneous pseudolymphoma, uh, or the skin disorder, are three that we completely, absolutely know are caused by the organism. All the rest of the signs are just, again, we don't know. That's all I can say is we are not certain. We've isolated it. The horses are oftentimes uh, gonna have, be seropositive, uh, but again, that's, that's a real challenge. Um, so the association of, of a Lyme infection with stiffness and lameness in horses is really not well documented. And as I mentioned before, there is no evidence of infection causing laminitis. So the actual range and the specific clinical signs associated with Lyme disease really need further experimental and epidemiological evaluation. And we've done this at Zoetis. We, we have infected horses with it. And I can tell you, dogs, when we worked on, when we got the canine vaccine, dogs read the textbook. They did exactly what they were supposed to do when they were affected, infected with Lyme disease with the Borrelia. Horses all over the place. But that's a horse. Um, so there are some uh, really unique aspects to Borrelia, and this is what makes it such a challenge. Following infection from the tick after it's attached for a period of time, uh, it will spread locally primarily through uh, connective tissue, the blood to some level, uh, but again, there can be both local and systemic dissemination of the, uh, of the organism. The organism resides in connective tissue. This is important because it, you can see my little note there, it does not need iron to survive. Most microbes, most microorganisms require a source of iron to survive. These little nasty organisms do not need iron to survive. Uh, where they get their iron from, the other organisms is blood. How do we treat those organisms? We give them antibiotics, 
Where is it? It's in the blood. And hi ho, hi ho, we hopefully cure or combat the infection. Not the case with Borrelia. Uh, the other thing, and I'm going to talk about this more in a second, is you see this ovoid formation or biofilm. This is a real nightmare. And this is where we are battling this right now. And uh, we're actually getting ready to start a study looking at this biofilm form. Uh, but essentially what a biofilm is, it's a defense mechanism for these particular organisms. What they will do is form a matrix, okay? Lipids, proteins, macromolecules, and they essentially go into hiding, okay? They have, uh, the, they, basically it's, they have a, a protective environment uh, that you can't treat. They just, there's no antibiotics, there's no way to treat them. So the organisms are essentially just hiding from the immune system, from antibiotics, from everything else. And they're just sitting there waiting for the conditions to become right for them to re-express themselves. The things that cause them to go into this biofilm, there you go, I've underlined exposure to antibiotics. And this is a problem I cannot express enough uh, because a lot of the antibiotics that we use because they can't get into the, they, they can't get to where the organism is in connective tissue a lot, uh, often. Uh, so you're basically just, you're, show, you, you're basically making the organism angry and it goes into a biofilm. Uh, starvation, pH changes, these are all defensive postures by this particular organism and it hides. Uh, it will not reactivate until the conditions are appropriate. Uh, so as I mentioned, yeah, that uh, this biofilm form is extremely challenging to treat, almost impossible to treat, incomplete penetration from or inactivation of antibiotics. So it will sit in this dormant state uh, for months, for an extended period of time until the conditions are correct and then they recrudesce. So a lot of times people will say, well, I treated my horse uh, and it got better, and, and then it started showing clinical signs again, uh, so it must have gotten reinfected. Well, it was because often the, it could have very likely been reinfected, or more often than not, this biofilm just relaxed, the organism reactivated, and off we go again. So this is a challenge, and I can't uh, highlight this enough. So, um, so uh, now, so what about testing? Here's another whole quagmire. There are no really good tests. And I've listed a bunch of them here. Um, there's ELISA's, there's Western blot, there's a multiplex, which you're probably all familiar with. That's a very popular test that comes out of Cornell, which has some problems with it. They all have some problems with them. Uh, but regardless of the methodology, a positive result does not prove causation of current signs or clinical infection, nor does a positive result predict whether the infection is likely to cause clinical disease in the future. So we do these tests, uh, but it's very, very difficult for us to absolutely say what they, what it actually means as far as the infection because of the biofilm, because of all the other uh, points that are associated with it. Uh, this test, the SNAP test, uh, people think ah, it's not very much. This is actually a really good test. Um, and if people are bound and determined to test their horses for some obscure signs or lameness or something that they think may be associated with Lyme disease because they pulled a tick off their horse, it's a quick and easy stall side test. Uh, it does it's based uh, on an antibody to a peptide, which is this region C6. Um, and it's, it's a really good test. So when we talk about sensitivity and specificity, um, if it's positive, 67% chance that's true. The interesting thing is if that test is negative, it's probably about 92 or 93% that that horse does not have the disease. So it's a SNAP test, it's a stall side test. Uh, it will, can also help diagnose anaplasmosis, which we see more frequently than Lyme disease. 
Uh, it's not licensed uh, for actually, uh, I don't think really any of these tests are licensed for use in horses, uh, but it's a good test. And I encourage the veterinarians as a screening test, if they insist on testing, this is a good one to go to. The multiplex, it's been around for a long time. It's, it's a fairly good test. Uh, they give you nice breakdown. So if the OSPE is high and you can see the sensitivity and specificity, they are not as good as the little C6 test. Uh, but OSPE usually or may indicate vaccination. Uh, I've seen horses that were not vaccinated that had OSPEs through the ceiling for a year. Uh, OSPE-C, here's where we get into the big problem. We do know that there are seven pathological variants of OSPE-C. That's a given. That's a fact. The problem is that the Cornell, the multiplex only tests for one. So it could come back negative, but your horse could be infected with one of the other six versions of the pathological variant. Uh, it usually takes several weeks after the tick bite and infection before we start to see increases in OSPC. And then finally, OSPF is if it's chronic. Uh, so that will, again, that's uh, again where we see the sensitivity or a positive as being a true, a, a positive there being true positive is, is pretty reasonable at 86%. Um, one of the things that I suggest oftentimes is if you get results that you have trouble interpreting from, from the multiplex, uh, the University of Connecticut's been at this for a really long time, and they do a combination of an ELISA and a Western blot, which are two pretty reasonable, pretty good tests. So I tell people, look, if the, if the multiplex is a bit sketchy, you don't understand it, back it up and do these tests. And at, now you've got several bits of data. Hopefully you've got the C6 test, the SNAP test, you've got the multiplex, and you've got the ELISA and the Western blot, and somewhere plus looking at the horse clinically, what is he doing? Somewhere in there is the truth. Um, so um, yeah, I'm about at the end here. So treatment, uh, here's another problem. So typically uh, we don't have an ideal regimen. The investigation is we don't have a good disease model and we've worked at this at Zoetis uh, for establishing a definite antemortem diagnosis. Uh, and then treatment recommendations have been based on in vitro studies. Uh, and we have, I've got a really nice one that I did with Dr. Divers a few years ago, uh, and, or they're extrapolated from human treatment guidelines. Typically what we do, we use oxytetracycline, minocycline, uh, ceftiafor or Naxel is what they frequently use on the human side. And doxycycline, which I know is a lot of veterinarians favorite and the clients like it, it's got huge problems. And if I could take all the doxycycline off the shelves, I would do that in a heartbeat, but that's a point for another, another discussion. Um, prevention, there are lots of different vaccines out there. None of those vaccines uh, are licensed in horses. Are people working on it? Yes, but it's a challenge. Uh, so most of them have just OSPE, but OSPE has a short half-life of about three months. Uh, so you have to revaccinate those horses. And oftentimes I know they say a double dose every three months, that gets wicked expensive. Uh, there is uh, several canine vaccines. A couple of years ago, Zoetis came out with a chimeric recombinant Lyme vaccine. And I mentioned the seven OSPE-C variants. Uh, that vaccine contains all the variants. So it's not just one, which is present in just about all the other vaccines. This one has all the variants in it, uh, but it is only licensed for use in horses. They're looking at tick saliva vaccines. Uh, there's a host of these things. So um, basically the challenge here is that uh, uh, again, that the infected ticks are there, you know, what is the geographic location? We've seen them all over the U.S. Clinical signs, again, nonspecific, all over the place. Oftentimes said anaplasmosis is what we find. Um, high antibody levels uh, to the Lyme or the Borrelia or identification of the organism. 
uh, or compatible psychology and pathology, that's a challenge also. Uh, ruling out other causes of the clinical signs. So sometimes these horses just are lame. They have joint disease or osteoarthritis. Um, the other thing is people will say after we start treating them with the tetracyclines, uh, it must be working because my horse is getting better. Well, tetracyclines have a very pronounced anti-inflammatory effect. That's probably why your horse looks better because of the anti-inflammatory effect where it's actually probably not even treating the Lyme disease if it's even there. Uh, so again, a host of issues and I'm gonna tie up here. Uh, for any of you that are interested, there's, um, the, um, there's a consensus statement. You can go to acvim.org. Uh, and the College of Internal Medicine, we put out every couple of years, we put out these consensus statements where they get a group of experts together and we look at all the data and say, what is the truth? What is out there right now? And what can we say is fact and what can we say is probably fiction? Uh, so in 2018, uh, we came out with a publication uh, that's on the, uh, and it's free. It's, it's, uh, it's an online journal. Uh, and it's free, but that was published in 2018. So you can go to acvim.org and just pull that consensus statement down and that'll give you all the information you need. And then the, just the bottom one is a, a study that uh, Dr. Divers and I did at, at Cornell where we looked at three different antibiotics for treating equine Lyme disease. And one of the things we found was that ceftiafur or Naxel, or in this case, Exceed, which is a long acting ceftiafur, uh, will probably work. And I know a lot of people that have used that. So Dr. C was born in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, she, uh, well, she was born in Nuremberg, Germany, but she grew up in uh, Suffren, New York. Dr. Gold graduated from Cornell University in 2000 in animal science. She was then accepted into veterinary school at Cornell and graduated in 2004. Upon her completion of her internship in California in 20, 2005, she then joined BW Furlong and Associates, which is uh, part of it is located here in New Jersey. She had a, a very special interest in regenerative medicine, lameness, and diagnostic imaging. Given her experience and strong interest in imaging, she also manages both the equine MRI of New Jersey and the advanced equine imaging of Wellington. Um, and she is based in Wellington for most of the winter. And I found out when we were talking earlier, she's actually down in Wellington right now and will be through, through even into June. So it's quite an extended season now. So Dr. Gold, director of Furlong's Sci uh, Soundness Center and has achieved board certification in equine sports medicine and rehabilitation. So we are gonna learn a little bit more about the Soundness Center. Um, let me uh, go ahead and share this little video with you. One of the things that gives me most satisfaction is trying to uncover all the layers of health and fitness and soundness for horses. Uh, over the course of being a veterinarian, I've seen horses sustain the same injuries sometimes over and over again. And when I uh, had to have shoulder surgery done on myself, I was absolutely blown away by the rehab they put me through. And I thought, we are so far behind in the horse world that I really need to try and do something about it. I'm Dr. Brendan Furlong. I'm the owner of the Furlong Soundness Center. FSC is a place that we can provide horses that have had injuries or need some downtime just to come and remember how to be horses again. To be able to see horses take a break and provide them with the ultimate vacation experience where they can heal is really important. It's about trying to create a happy and a healthy and a physically strong horse. The amount of time that they put into these horses one-on-one -on -one is just quite amazing. These horses are receiving just a lot of individual attention and they really like that. These horses are very, very well loved and well cared for. Just very rewarding to be able to be part of that team. When your horse is admitted here, we tailor the treatment plan specifically toward your horse. All of the activities that we're doing have scientific soundness behind it. We have a regenerative laser, which works very differently than your traditional cold lasers or lasers that lay people can use in barns. It's a very, very high powered modality, which actually has the ability to regenerate tissues to start growing back in a biomechanical, meaningful way. Here we have a lot of fun toys to play with. I sometimes refer to it as the horse's camp activity. 
We have the hot walker. We have the vibrating plate therapy. We have a solarium. We have the cold water spot. Treadmilling. As soon as we can, we will start putting them into the water, which adds a different component of strength training and conditioning. And then as people get their horses back and can start to get on them, the feedback that we get is, my horse never felt this balanced. And it's because we're, we're balancing the horse from the second that we could get them out of the stall. We are a little bit unique in that we are exclusively managed and uh, overseen on a daily basis by veterinarians. Well, it's a team. You can't fix these animals and get them back to a degree of success by yourself. It's, it's impossible. We work with a, a really great team of, uh, of radiologists and surgeons uh, to help us sort of reach that diagnosis. And so my relationships with the referring veterinarians become very important and they have a very, very integral role in what we're doing and what we're trying to figure out. Other referring veterinarians who send us cases for bone scans or for MRIs or whatever are very happy to, to then have the horses come here for rehabilitation. I'm incredibly lucky to work in a beautiful environment. Um, we have truly some of the best clients um, and the best patients that you could ask for in the industry. Um, and that becomes important because it allows us to do what we do best, which is, is try to help and fix these horses. Quite often we get an, a note or an email or a Facebook comment from the owner, from the trainer saying, thank you so much, the, this is the horse back in the winner circle or this is the horse back uh, at the, the highest level of competition. That's very gratifying. Everybody likes to get that uh, notice that the horse went on, did well once it left here. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time, but it's, it's time well spent. It's really the best, the best way in my mind to be able to provide a service to these animals that give us, you know, so much joy and pleasure on a on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that the health and well-being of the horse should come first. How do you measure happiness in a horse? We create an environment free of stress with people who are dedicated to doing a really good job. So that, that gives a very nice intro to what Dr. Gold is going to talk to us today about. Um, and I asked her to give us kind of the goods, bads, ins, out, new, tried, tested, and to, true um, with rehabilitation. So um, Dr. Gold, I'll let you go ahead and unmute, share your screen, and, uh, and take it away. And just a reminder to everybody, that I am managing the questions uh, in the Q&A box. So if you do, did have anything for our last speaker, we're going to have the panel at the very end. Um, if you have any for Dr. Gold as well, you can do the same. So go ahead and uh, take it away, sir. Hopefully everyone can hear me and see my screen. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lamb, so much for having me come and share some thoughts uh, about a subject that I'm really passionate about. Um, I do wish we were in person, um, but I'm really excited to see how many people are interested in the subject. So hopefully I can keep you all awake and um, follow up Dr. Chrisman, um, who did an awesome job. I know I have a lot of questions, but um, I'm gonna focus on something completely different, um, which is uh, rehab and conditioning in horses. So um, I am going to try, it's sort of the way my brain works is I, I do jump around quite a bit, which hopefully at this hour um, may be better, um, but I'm going to probably start by putting you a little bit to sleep with some definitions. Um, just so we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. And then we'll go into a little bit, what do we know about tissue healing and athletic training? Um, and I think it's really important to remember that, um, you know, I'm going to be talking very broadly about injury and then levels of athleticism. And a lot of it applies to the to higher levels of athletes, um, equine athletes. But any horse that's working for a living um, is an athlete. And I think it's really important to treat them that way and remember some basic principles, um, which um, we're learning more and more about, especially, you know, kind of extrapolating from the human world and applying what we know in the horse world. And then using, again, some of those same principles, um, how can we improve longevity and health of athletic performance? So I'll already slide, um, but again, just trying to get us on the same page. So when we talk about rehabilitation, we're talking about the action of restoring someone to health or normal life through training and therapy after imprisonment, addiction, or illness, and then conditioning is a process of training or custom or customizing a person or animal to behave in a certain way or to accept certain circumstances. 
And then when we're talking about athletes, we, we extend the idea of conditioning and fitness into sports-specific conditioning. Um, this concept's been around for a while in a, a paper that came out in 1994. Um, but even before then, um, where we talk about uh, the goals of the athlete is that we want to optimize performance. And then from my perspective and from our perspective in the sports medicine field is that we want to be able to do that, but we want to minimize our injury risk. So in, we have to prepare the athlete's body for mecha mechanical and metabolic demands inherent to the particular sport. Um, but we don't want to overwork the athlete to the point where they're going to get hurt. And there's a concept called periodization, which we'll get into a little bit later, um, which is it, a really good framework for keeping the individual athlete's workload as high as possible without overtraining an injury. So an example would be, um, if we look at the, the image on the right, um, you know, a horse that's jumping a real big jump, um, artificial footing, um, this is at the um, Miami Horse Show, um, you know, he's, he's being asked to turn in the air, um, don't know how the distance went before, but this is a fairly complicated movement. Um, and in order to be able to do this successfully, um, and if we imagine, for example, this is a jump off, um, we can't train every day at the jump off level because we will definitely be injured. But the horse needs to practice timing, balance, um, and just where to put their feet. So one way to think about that would be to do something like Cavaletti training. So the horse does learn how to balance. So when he's asked to do this sort of uncontrolled movement um, very quickly, um, at the fence, he does, he automatically knows and how to engage his core and how to use his body in the safest way possible. And he's strong enough that he can land in any particular way or take off any particular way and not have the same risk of injury as a horse that potentially doesn't have as much strength in his core muscling, which the core muscling is really where, uh, where the body is meant to absorb all this impact. And if we don't have that, those forces start to get transferred down to the tiny little ligaments and tendons of the legs, which were never meant to withstand those forces over time. And then over time accumulate an amount of stress that results in injury. So when we talk about rehabilitation and I, and I took this slide um, from a colleague of mine, um, because this, this is a, fairly standard way to think about how we rehab horses. Um, and I was basically just too lazy to make my own. Um, so we talk about wanting to fix pain inflammation, diagnose a lesion, and I can't overemphasize accurate diagnosis enough. Um, and then when we start our recovery process, first thing we'll do is try to um, relearn or re-understand balance and proprioception where we are in space, how we use our bodies. Then we want to be more stable and we want to encourage and develop flexibility. Um, and then I put a green line here to indicate at the rehab center or what most medical teams do, we sort of stop there in a lot of ways because that's what we can do with the walk, um, maybe a little bit into trot and canter, but we're not getting into very sports specific training at the rehabilitation level or the early conditioning levels. Once we start getting over this green line, now we're talking about strength, endurance, and coordination and agility, which is going to be targeted more to what that horse's particular job is, that becomes more a part of um, the training team. So your coaches, your trainers, um, whoever else you have in your, in your horseman, basically involved with your horse and looking at it more from almost a horsemanship standpoint. And certainly in humans, there are strength and conditioning teams that have specialists that look at each one of those things. Equine medicine, we're not, we're not there yet in identifying all of those factors, um, but that's, that is where that piece comes into play. And then if we reverse this, um, how we wind up with injury is we have a loss of coordination and agility, a loss of strength and endurance. We start to lose stability and flexibility, balance, proprioception and then ultimately wind up with a lesion. And so in the majority of cases that I see, certainly in the sport horse world, this is more of a chronic process. Um, it's very rare that, or it's almost completely impossible to take a completely normal tendon, ligament, or bone and break it. Um, that, there has to be incredible force on that. So if something breaks or um, tears, there's usually a degenerative component to that. That being said, as soon as we identify the lesion, and as long as we don't have something that's completely broken and the horse can walk, um, 
we start our rehab program as soon as possible. So we really do avoid stall rest because quite frankly, a horse that's in a stall, the only thing that that horse's body is gonna get good at is standing in a stall. Um, most of us have horses that we wanna do some sort of athletic work with. So it's very important to at least address this bottom part of the chart um, as soon as we can, days, weeks after injury, and then, um, and then increase up from there. So just a little example of this. Um, this is a case that was referred in to our rehab. It was a bit complicated. Um, this is a six-year-old warm blood jumper gelding um, that came to us because uh, they wanted us to put the horse onto the water treadmill as part of a rehabilitation program because he had had uh, surgery and was still lame postoperatively. Um, so this case, um, when it came to me, when I ultrasounded it, so the top, um, the top image was at admission, and this horse had, um, if you, oops, if you can see my arrow here, this black area that's on the tendon, that's an area of fiber loss. So there's actually a hole in this tendon and the area where this injury happened, which is this area right underneath the carpal, the carpal bone, right, on, right in the back of the knee, um, that area worries me a lot because that's a very unusual place to tear. Um, most chronic injuries, or even if they're acute, but most tendon injuries happen more in this middle part of the leg because that's where the tendon has the worst blood flow. So up here, you're getting close to where the tendon actually has some muscle component to it. So it actually has decent blood flow. So horses that have this, this injury typically have something else wrong. This isn't something that just came out of nowhere. Um, so in digging a little bit deeper into this horse's history, the horse actually had a history of tendon problems going back almost five years. And when I compared the two front legs, I noticed there was fluid in the carpal canal indicating this chronic inflammatory process. And so for me to meet the expectation of putting this horse onto the water treadmill, I was um, a little uncomfortable with that and had to take a bit of a moment of pause because this doesn't fit my criteria for underwater treadmill. Um, and I and we'll go into a little bit later why we have to be really careful with water exercise in horses. But what I didn't know is this injury, um, and we just watched it over a month where there was still a, still a hole present. Um, if this was on the process of unraveling um, and anything that I did to this could potentially set that off and that becomes actually a life-threatening process. So I didn't want to just put it into the water channel. I wanted to monitor it and see which way we went. So um, I think a really important concept to understand, and we'll get back to that case in a minute, is, is how tissues heal. And this is one of the first versions of this chart that I saw um, in 2010, but it's in every orthopedic, book, human, animal, that goes through this process of how things heal. And, um, and this is true of every soft tissue. Uh, bone's a little bit different. Bone heals very differently and actually has the capacity to completely regenerate with, um, if it's healthy bone. Um, but what, we, what happens is in the first two to three weeks, we have this, I'm sorry, the first uh, few days, we have this very acute inflammatory process. So this is when you're going to be applying your ice. This is, is when you want to rest with very minimal walking, um, just enough to get them out of the stall and try to get things moving a little bit. Um, but this, this area is basically, this time everything is, is a bit of a war zone. So we just want to try to get everything to calm down. So even if you get called out because the leg got swollen just after a jump school or a training session or something, um, and we do ultrasound it and we see something, um, we still want to wait a little bit to see how things sort of shake out. So we want to hit this really hard with anti-inflammatories. Um, and then, and then over the next two weeks, we're going to start to get that clear out a little bit. And then when we ultrasound it, we can see a little bit better what we're dealing with. And that's when we're going to recommend or, or talk about maybe orthobiologics. Um, I should also say that we use the regenerative laser a lot in this acute inflammatory phase as well, because again, we want to sort of optimize that acute cleanup process. Um, but here we're going to get into um, doing some, maybe some direct injections with orthobiologics or regenerative medicine. And then from the next about three to six weeks, um, we start to get some film. That's going to be type one collagen. And then really going over the next three, three months to six months, and then even out to a year, um, this is where you're going to get the remodeling. So you're actually going to get strength. Um, and here's again, where, where the rehab becomes really important because this is where we want to tell the horse's body as you're laying down this tissue, 
this is what your job's going to be. It's not going to be standing in a stall. It's going to be carrying your weight and moving and doing different exercise, again, with low impact, but to try to train the, the tissue along the tensile lines of biomechanics of what the horse's job is ultimately going to be. And for any science nerds out there like myself, this is, this is a much more detailed version of what's going on and why the other chart looks the way it does, which is just the different type of cells that are coming in, doing different sorts of things. Um, but what's, what's important to see is the numbers down here at the bottom. So in this first really acute inflammatory phase, we only have 10% strength. And then up for the next month, we're about 30 to 40. And then from, again, that one month, two month, three month, up to a year, now we're at 50%, 70%. And depending on how chronic the process was leading up to the actual tear, um, we're dealing with tissue that doesn't have normal tensile strength, which it becomes important when we think about re-injury. Um, and then to jump again, to keep you all awake, um, when we talk about water, and we're talking about putting horses onto a water treadmill, I think it is important to uh, just make the distinction that uh, I'm talking about putting horses onto a water treadmill, which is very different than swimming sport horses. Um, and the reason why I want to bring that up is because when you put a horse into a pool and make them swim, um, it is important to realize we are making them swim. They are not, horses are not natural swimmers. They do a very violent action behind where they're sort of kicking out. And then they sort of use their front end to steer a little bit, but they're not like dogs. They can't swim like that. So a horse that, that has a bad neck or bad back, they're, they're inverting their back and they're inverting their neck. Um, any low arthritis in the lower neck, which is very common in older sport horses, as well as the back, as well as hocks, um, you are going to aggravate that with swimming. Um, most of the sport horses I work on are quite large. So the amount of water that they displace, and then typically with their level of fitness, the amount of energy and fitness they need to have in order to swim doesn't equate and they could sink. So that is terrifying. Um, but really where swimming has a really good role is, uh, is in racehorses because now you have a way to really improve your cardiovascular fitness. These horses are typically very young, so you don't have the neck and back concerns that you would have with an older horse that maybe has some arthritis. Um, and this is a very good way to get younger horses, get a better amount of fitness on them. Um, but that is a very specific population. So again, going back to the water treadmill, um, and we'll get into, we'll do a little bit of a dive into this, but there's a lot of research behind this. Um, and there was most recently a consensus for general use of equine water treadmills for healthy horses, which is a really nice summary. It is a free paper. Um, so if you go into PubMed, like Dr. Chrisman was talking about, or no, I think he's just sent me straight to ACBIM, but if you go into PubMed, um, and you just go, you just look up equine water channels, this paper will come up and has free access. And it's a really nice summary of what we know about applying um, equine water channels as a part of a horse's conditioning program. Um, but the factors that we consider, the height of the water, how fast is the horse walking, the temperature of the water, because the horses can generate a lot of heat and warm the water, and then they can't cool off because they're in this warm water, um, how long they're doing the exercise for, some horses patient temperament i mean if you have an expensive horse and you got this expensive water treadmill and the patient's not into it um this may not be a good exercise for them because you might have a loss of equipment um there's a very big difference between uh, treadmills that are underground and above ground both in clinical effect clinical use and cost uh, most importantly and the underground treadmills uh, they can really give you the buoyancy effect, which is the ability to float the horse and make it really low impact. Um, but those treadmills are much, much more expensive and, and, diff and more difficult to maintain. Um, and the effects of being able to float the horses is, is not necessarily always necessary. Um, and then the patient itself, um, how, how fit are they? Can they even push through the water? Um, so we do have to be very careful about fatigue, both cardiovascular, and then just if they're getting sore, if they're getting tired, because we don't want to exhaust the muscles again, because then those stresses come down into the legs um, and don't help your leg injuries. Um, and then we have to think about afterwards recovery, and we'll get into the concept of recovery in a little bit, but um, recovery is very, very important. So the consensus paper does a really nice job. Um, Dr. Melissa King, uh, she her PhD work at CSU, um, was one of the pivotal papers in, in talking about how improving that horses with arthritis um, 
when they induced arthritis in the horse's knees and then put them into the water treadmill, they found, they found better soundness, the horses were stronger, um, and they were actually able to improve lameness scores. Um, so this could actually be considered one of those prophylactic and performance enhancing treatments because you are making the horse so much stronger. So um, when we talk about putting horses into treadmills, this is, these are the big pieces that we think about. We talked about buoyancy already, osmolality. So water um, does have anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects. So the horse will feel better. We can resolve inflammation, make things feel better. We do need to think about how fast the horse is moving through the water. We have to monitor and make sure they're walking straight. Um, if they're cheating or leaning one way or another, they're indicating that they're not strong enough or they may have some soreness. So we do need to make sure that that is all thought about. Um, their viscosity of the water. Um, so we respect how much effort is required to move through that. And then hydrostatic pressure. So actually just the pressure of the water, um, the volume of the water that's being displaced by the horse, um, that will promote venous return and lymph drainage. So we'll actually get, um, again, another way to reduce inflammation. So the next couple of slides are going to be really wordy. Um, I actually pulled these from um, a massive library of paper reviews I had to do for my board studying. Um, and this is just a tiny little peek into the amount of research that has gone into understanding how water treadmill affects horses. Um, so this is an example of a study that showed that putting the water at the stifle height actually affected the way the back was moving. Um, so with increased extension of the back, um, and then in other parts of the back increased flexion. So if you have a horse with kissing spines, SI issues, these things need to be considered what that water height's gonna be because how much do we wanna affect the back? And if we start to notice the horse isn't walking well, this can also be a bit diagnostic. If there's no real reason why the horse should be having a problem, maybe the water is too high uh, and maybe the horse has a back problem. So we do need to think about those things um, when, we're, when we're setting water height. Um, this is another study that basically showed that um, pelvic flexion changes with water depth. Um, and then both in the up and down and then the sort of twisting around axial rotation. Um, so that, depending on where we put the water, will put a different type of stress onto those areas. Um, again, just more, just more depending on where we put it. The normal ranges of motion of every single joint has been worked out. Um, there's big chapters and textbooks about this. Um, what does that mean? Well, when we then put them into water, uh, we're gonna change the range of motion of these joints, which when we're thinking about return to athletic function and if a joint has been either um, manipulated surgically, it has arthritis, it has some other sort of disease process, how much rotation or how much range of motion do we want that particular joint to be undergoing and what part of the rehab does become appropriate to get more. Um, and then also just the size of, or the length of the stance phase and the swing phase of so the horse's stride, the frequency and how they're moving. And remember the horse is moving on a treadmill, which is gonna pull the horse's body back. Um, the, all of those pieces go into the stresses that you're putting onto the horse. Um, this is another one that's just showing that we changed how far the horse in its front legs can reach forward or back depending on how high the water is. Um, and this is another study that actually shows that depending on how we're using the water channel, are we changing the properties of muscle, um, which can become very important depending on what the horse's job is. So type one, type two muscle fibers, fast switch, slow twitch, um, those come into play. Where is the horse have to do more of an endurance exercise? Is it more of a power and speed? Um, is it more of a cardiovascular type of response that we're looking for? So those horses all look different and we can actually affect the type of muscle fibers that those horses are laying down. Um, and that's a bit early on. Um, there isn't like a magical formula, like we put the horse in at this height, with this amount of time, we're gonna make it faster. Um, it's gonna be very, very different, but this is some initial work to at least show that what we know in humans to be true, we can also start to apply to the horse. So if we go back to our case example, uh, after 30 days, um, we did get some fill of the tendon. And at this point we were doing just drive treadmill work. Um, we were doing um, a, num a number of different things, physiotherapy, we were also using the laser. Um, and we saw 
it, just in one month, um, an improvement here. There is some tissue being laid down in here. So if you remember, this is just another version of that graph, but this is a cut and paste from the, the reports that I sent to owners every month. And I like to include this so people can understand um, where they are in this process. So in this case, where we're starting to get some fill, we're out of this inflammatory phase. We're going into this proliferative phase, um, but we still have all these months where we have to remodel. And remember this force um, is a chronic offender. Um, and if we look here, I, I put the statement, chronic chronicity of injury, the age of the horse, this horse is a little bit older, he's 14. His ability to heal, well, I mean, he's been struggling for a number of years. Um, do he have any contributing conformational factors? How's he built? How is he carrying himself? What's his biomechanics? Um, does he have any other issues? Um, this is where obesity, metabolic syndrome, um, and people, uh, they talk a lot about diabetes um, and other you know, poor health habits that people may have um, that, that affect this uh, greatly. So we do like to remember where this is. So at this point, we still got, got some um, fiber loss here. So at this point, we recommended um, doing a uh, doing a PRP injection because um, we knew we were comfortably not in, a, in a, an acute inflammatory state anymore. The horse was stable. Um, so we did PRP and then it just in an, about another month or so after that, we repeated our ultrasound. We start to see now we really don't see that hole anymore. We do, we have like maybe a line or two of fiber in there. Um, but overall we have really good fill of this very otherwise, you know, chronically affected tendon. The horse was the soundest we'd ever seen him. Um, and we did have him. So at this point, we were doing 30 minutes twice a day on the dry treadmill, which he handled beautifully. We were very slowly introducing water um, just because he does need to jump and he's a little bit older. So we were very careful about how we applied the water. And we worked very slowly up to 20 minutes. Um, and then we were also doing physiotherapy, our laser, our therapeutic ultrasound, and the Theragun. Um, was done prior to work to warm up the tissues and, and encourage elasticity. And then afterwards, applying some sort of cryotherapy um, to just kind of cool everything down. And then we would also apply the saltwater spa in this case at the end of the, at the, end of the treatment. So, um, so that horse, um, so we started with something way at the bottom of our uh, rehabilitation conditioning. Um, uh, my, the words are escaping me. <laughs> The bottom, the bottom, the bottom of the chart, and um, and now we have to start moving up and and get closer to this green line. And really, any horse can do this. Here's a picture of uh, Dr. King, who I referenced earlier. Um, this is a mule, a performance mule, and um, I would say that there are a lot of high high performance horses that probably can't do this. So this horse is in full forelimb protraction. Um, can get full extension, parallel to the ground, and then she's also standing on these sure foot pads or balance pads. So she is actually needs her core to be able to stand on something that is not firm. So she has to maintain her balance on that and then take one leg and have it pulled and moved and manipulated through a full range of motion. Um, so this is get really getting into stability, flexibility. We've already, you know, a horse that's doing this or a mule that's doing this. Um, is, there, is already past balance and proprioception. She knows exactly where her legs are. She can balance very, very well. And she's actually demonstrating great stability and flexibility at this point. And, um, and then these are just, you know, some before and after pictures of a horse that, you know, typical warm blood that comes in, has a couple of extra pounds on it. Not much, not a great top line, um, no, no motor. Um, and then when it's getting ready to leave, we've knocked the weight off, we're, we're leaner. Um, we have a more rounded motor back here now. Remember, this is where all the propulsion comes from for jump work um, and, and just an overall more athletic animal that can stand square. Um, it's one of the, actually the first things I look for is can the horse stand like an athlete? Can it, can it, does it naturally want to have good posture or is it going to be kind of slumped um, and maybe guarding or just weak, just a weak stance? Um, and then and this horse, the, the horse on the bottom, um, this version of that horse could water treadmill all day, every day. Um, quite comfortably. So applying that, those thoughts, um, can we reduce injury rate and improve performance? And in the human world, the answer is an emphatic yes. Um, one of the first times I heard this concept um, was from Dr. Chris Stackpole, who, who's in this picture here, and anybody's ever heard me talk, probably haven't seen this slide. Um, so the Portland Trailblazers were the, um, they had the highest injury rate in the NBA at the time, at the time, um, and 
one of the reasons why this has really well worked out in humans is because we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And I actually have a slide in that I took out when, for example, like when Kevin Durant got hurt, missed the majority of the season, that team lost $50 million. So when you're losing tens of millions of dollars, there's a big impetus to try to solve this problem. Um, so what uh, Dr. Stackhouse did when he came, or Stackpole came in and said, all right, well, let's identify the factors that we think are contributing to this. And what, what's worked out very well in humans is that diet, cross training for strength, and then your recovery, your sleep or your active recovery, those are the three most com important components to improve your rate of injury. Um, so he started applying these principles. And then if you look at the red line, which is your league average of injury, he dropped them very quickly down to the $6 million mark, which is way below the um, NBA average of injury. So just by, just by applying these principles. Um, so do we think that this applies to horses? We absolutely do. Um, the exact formula, which he um, has, you know, work, that's been very worked out in human athletes. Um, what does that look like for horses? Um, you know, there's, there's some different parts here, but certainly we can appreciate, you know, being on a good diet, cross training for strength, and then making sure horses have adequate recovery. Um, we want to start applying some of these, these human thoughts to how we train. So as I mentioned earlier, periodization training, that's the deliberate manipulation of training variables to optimize performance for competition, prevent overtraining and progress performance. So there's a lot of different, um, articles that talk about this. I just pulled this one out because this one's actually a bit simple. Um, but what you want to think about is that you, is when do you want the athlete to peak? And there's a couple of different training regimens, um, and it is very sport specific in humans, but most human athletes peak one to two times a year. So what you want to do is make your peak happen at the most important time. Um, so the way you do that in, is you work backwards and you say, okay, well, I want to peak and we're talking about, we got the Olympics going on right now. So let's just talk about the Olympics. So if we want to peak at the Olympics, um, we go all the way back through the entire year and figure out, you know, okay, well, where, where, where are we starting from? Where's our complete recovery, like ground zero. So that would be our preparatory period. And when we start doing that, we're going to do very simple exercises that are medium intensity, but we're going to do it a lot. Um, to just get the body to start thinking about it. And then as we start transitioning to get closer to the competition period, we're going to start ramping up the more sport specific technique and training. And we're going to, but we're going to decrease the volume. And then as that happens, you will get your peak at the right time. And then as soon as that peak's done, you're going to go into an active recovery. And this, this will get into, we'll get into in a moment if that's actually how you build strength. So when you have a, a seasoned athlete, where the body really knows and understands what the job is. There's good muscle memory. Um, the, the athlete is mentally understanding. And now obviously I'm talking about people. They understand the job. They understand the game. They understand their teammates. Um, this is going to look a little bit different for this seasoned athlete versus an athlete, a young athlete that needs to learn those different things. And sometimes you have to stay here a little bit longer Sometimes you have to kind of get into the techniques a little bit faster, and that's all going to be very sport specific and a little bit individual. But again, this idea of, of being able to train so you peak at the right time is very well worked out. Um, and then in terms of getting better, um, so there, and this is an extrapolation to an equine device, um, which is trying trying to do a similar thing that's happened in people. But, um, and this company is based out of Europe, so that is supposed to be physical pH. But, um, so when we talk about, you know, the average physical fitness of an athlete, and then your other axis here is time, what you do is you do, you'll do a training session here at time zero, and the body will decompensate. So if we think back to that healing time, the body does get injured in a really intense training session, but it's on a very microscopic level. So you're not tearing anything that you'd see on an ultrasound, you're not gonna break anything, but that is what results in delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. Um, you know, that's that feeling being really sore the next day or something. So you don't want to apply another training session when your tissues are already a little bit compromised. You may at this point want to do um, a stretching day or just a very light run or something like that um, until the body recovers. And in humans, it's about 72 hours. Um, and then that's, and then, the, so then the next time that you train, the body's now recovered and it's a little bit stronger. So if you follow that 
appropriately, what you're going to find is athletic growth. So that is the super compensation where your body's growing, the, everything's getting stronger. And that's how you can train specifically for improvement in your sport. If you overtrain, where you just keep applying this, this overtraining paradigm over time, the body's actually going to keep re-injuring, decompensating. And then this is where you result in ultimately the tear. So an example, and Tim Warden, his PhD, he used to study, he originally studied human biomechanics, now has done a really deep dive in looking at um, top FBI show jumpers and trying to look for patterns and things. Um, he's, this is an example of how you figure that out. So when you're looking at the horse's competition schedule, and this is a horse that'd be in Wellington, and then it's going to go to Spruce and come back to East Canadian. So he's following some of those horses. And then this is how they work it out. Um, so they take the year, they break it down by month days, weeks, um, and then even just into just hours um, of what the horses are going to do, um, when certain things are going to happen, um, and, and just building that all in, knowing when they want to peak, and then making sure, again, that they're really building in that active recovery time, so you don't wind up going down the graph, you want to be going up the graph. Um, so, to, so the goal, of course, is to maximize potential. So, um, so we want this maximize the potential to be pain-free um, because obviously pain is an indication of injury. But what we do find is that elite level athletes, um, if you really image them to the nitty gritty, and certainly um, I do with my teams, we're, we're MRIing horses all day, every day. You do see quite a bit that horses walk around with, especially as they get older. And there is for sure in human athletes, it's, it's that it's the um, it's the ability to deal with a little bit of discomfort. I know when I when I'm doing my little peloton runs and they say get uncomfortable, get uncomfortable, and I'm like eh, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to do this. That's why I'm not a great athlete. But good athletes and top level athletes do learn how to be uncomfortable, um, and they need to tolerate that because that is what it takes to be at the top of sport. So the the gentleman horse on the right um that's nick skelton and big star and this is them winning the gold medal in rio they're both seasoned senior athletes they both have had significant medical issues uh, musculoskeletal issues but they are so good they, they really didn't need to practice anything bubble wrapped themselves and basically went and won gold medal um and were perfectly happy to do all of it um were they uncomfortable i mean maybe a little bit but that's what that's sort of what that takes. So we do have to understand that that's that that immeasurable quality of the heart of the horse, um, which there's I don't know how you use science to figure that out other than a horse just that just loves its job. And that's the horsemanship aspect of it. But in order to maximize the potential, um, we want to be looking at musculoskeletal systems, neuromuscular um, systems, how the body is communicating with itself, how it understands and is processing everything. There's a biomechanical component to it. Um, we remember that it's two athletes. So if the person's a little bit unbalanced, that could be cause some imbalance in the horse and vice versa. Um, and we need to adjust. And if those balances, as long as they work together, are okay, you can still have a very successful outcome as in this, this case. Um, I'm just checking my time. Oh, I only got five minutes. Okay. So can we prevent injury? So um, every year I'm involved with a group um, and then uh, this year I had the honor of um, moderating the keynote session with Dr. McElraith and then other distinguished panelists, Tim Ober, Roger Smith, Lisa Fortier, and this is all the brainchild of Dr. Mark Rabinall. Um, where we kind of talked about this concept of can we prevent injuries or can we be prophylactic in our approaches? Um, with definition of prophylaxis being action taken to prevent the disease. Um, you know, is, is, are there, is there anything that we can do for our horses to, to prevent things. And so the example we we're working with, um, we're talking specifically about arthritis and just um, kind of taking some ideas from Dr. Michael Ray's talk here is, um, so he, he back in 1979, that proved and demonstrated because it had not been proven up to this point that synovitis or inflammation of just the joint itself, the effusion in the joint causes arthritis. So up until that point, there was no definition of that. Um, and with that inflammation comes, first you just have general inflammation in the joint. Then you'll have, start to have change in the cartilage. The later stages is actually where you start to see the bone, bone remodeling, which is what we see on x-ray. So by the time you're seeing it on x-ray, you're already kind of behind the eight ball. The first question we were sort of talking about is, well, if you have a normal joint, 
Um, can we prophylactically keep it normal? Answer is emphatically no. If you have something that's normal, it's just normal. Um, and you can do whatever you want. It's still normal. You can't change anything about that. Once you start getting a little bit of inflammation in the joint, that's where we can step in and try to help things to prevent it from progressing to, um, to actual arthritis. And this, this schematic on the right, which is from Dr. Mukherjee's textbook, um, just shows how complicated the, the um, arthritic cascade is, starting with, at the very top, interleukin-1. And that's where IRAP, which some of you may know, that's where that fits in. So trying to stop that very, very top part of the cascade because you just don't want things to progress to where you're seeing things on x-ray because then you're a little bit behind the eight ball. And there's a ton of different treatments and um, devices that we use to try to do that. Some of them are symptom modifying, so they just make things feel better, but they're not changing the disease process. If we're actually changing the disease process, we call that disease modifying. And then we step in with, with different, um, different modalities to try to address this. But again, we have to understand what is causing that um, and, and fix any underlying factors um, in order to know which ones even apply. Um, so when we talk about that, as I said before, I'm just gonna speed up a little bit for time. Um, can we actually say that we're prophylactically treating a joint if we're giving adequate or we're putting some steroids in or something like that? Well, if there's something wrong with the joint, then no, you're not, you're not doing anything because you're not affecting anything in the joint. If you can get on top of that inflammatory process and bring it back to zero, um, there's nothing more for you to do. Um, we have to worry more about ongoing processes, which are due to ongoing traumas, which is continued exercise and continued work. So this concept of prophylaxis, I mean, what can we do to prevent things? Well, I, I put my, this picture here of me jogging the standard because I'm actually very impressed with the way a lot of standard people understand this. I mean, they have these horses working at a very consistent level, um, they pay a lot of attention to how they eat and how they sleep. Um, and they only train them once or twice. They only take them up to training speed once or twice a week. And the rest of the time is active recovery and working on cardiovascular. So I think, you know, they, they hit the nail right on the head in terms of how to keep those horses sound and comfortable. And that is one of the reasons why standards can have a very long racing career. Um, so proactive strengthening of musculoskeletal system and neurologic systems is very helpful. That could be considered prophylactic. We want to pick the right athletes. So we think about how they're bred, what their pedigrees are, how they're built, and their soundness histories. That that would be prophylactic. Um, when we're thinking about buying them, um, we're picking them that move correctly. They have the right attitude towards the job. They want to jump. They want to do dressage. They want to do a cross country course. I mean, I've been to enough. I've been privileged enough to be in enough three days to know that if you you know once a three once a um, top level eventing horse gets his eyes onto the next fence, you'd almost get hurt trying to pull him off of it. I mean, he wants to go. So that's a suitability issue. And then again, confirmation, we'll do some x-rays to make sure things are not stressed in areas that are important. The, the art of training horsemanship, you know, building that, that foundation for fitness and musculoskeletal health is very important. And then, I mean, this is, this is, it doesn't really exist exactly, but do we want to build the tissue better with gene therapies? Do we want to actually alter the DNA to make the mitigation of inflammation better? Well, that's also kind of gene doping or blood doping. So um, probably not really um, legal, but that would be another way to think of prophylaxis. Um, I'm going to skip that just for time. Um, so in conclusion, um, rehabilitation is an essential part of recovery from disease. But we can still use a lot of those principles to promote the overall well-being of the equine athlete and encourage long-term soundness. And then fitness, conditioning, good management, and training practices can improve your athletic longevity. So just thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I hope everyone's still awake. And thank you so much for, uh, to Rutgers University and Dr. Perry for inviting me to speak. And, of course, everyone I work with um, and all the horses that I'm lucky enough to work with. And if anybody has any questions that don't get answered, um, best way to get me is my email, um, which I have up here. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, both Dr. Gold and Dr. Chrisman. Um, I think the one uh, uh, saddest thing for me being virtual is you can't hear the big round of applause after all the speakers, but um, I hope everybody um, is doing a very nice big round of applause um, for both of our speakers. So what I would like to do now, and I know we've been kind of plucking away at some of the questions on the Q&A, 
um, as the speakers have been talking, but there are a couple that um, have already been asked that I do want to address here live. Um, but then I would ask anybody if you have any questions uh, to either of our speakers, please ask them in the Q&A. Um, and then I will ask them live and ask the speakers. There was quite a few questions and we did answer some of them, but it goes back to what you first started talking about with Potomac horse fever. Can you just address those um, where, where a lot of the cases reside in the US and, uh, and where they've been found most, um, Northeast, Midwest, et cetera? Can you, can you address that briefly? Yeah, we, Dr. Williams, we see them basically from the mid-Atlantic um, all the way you know, up into New England, around the Great Lakes uh, is where most of them, but because it's not a reportable disease, uh, we really don't have a good grasp on it. We know that there are a lot of vaccines that are sold, uh, but usually because it has a fairly complex life cycle um, that ends with the, uh, with the, um, the, the flying, the cated flies, the small insects, we, we had a case, this was a couple of years ago, and usually Potomac horse fever occurs as one or two horses in a group. That's standard. Usually it's just one. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had an outbreak at Liberty University, which is in Lynchburg. And what they, what they used to do, they had a big communal water troughs outside of the paddocks, and they would bring the horses into the stalls at night, and they had big floodlights out in the paddocks which attracted all kinds of insects. Uh, and they actually had seven cases of Potomac horse fever all at once. The first case they actually put on a trailer to bring to the vet school and it died on the trailer, unfortunately. I think uh, they had several losses, but that's the, the only case that I'm personally aware of where it was an outbreak, but it was all due to keeping floodlights on. And if there's a common water source like that, uh, with lights on at night, it attracted all the nasty little insects, and there you go. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not aware of a lot of cases out west. I do hear it periodically, uh, but yes, we we can see it all across the U.S., but m to my knowledge, most of them are mid-Atlantic and New England and Great Lakes region. Got it. Got it. Well, there's another question for you dealing more with Lyme. And this is, you did mention about extreme starvation um, and then the Lyme will go into a protective uh, mode. Um, how, how extreme of starvation are you talking about? Yeah. Is it something that if they're just on a diet, is that enough? <laughs> no, this is more related. And I'm sorry, I didn't clarify that a little better. Uh, it had to do not with this particular starvation of the animal, but of the organism. So if the organism, and the big thing that puts it into the biofilm is what we call antibiotic stress. Um, so if the, if the organism is not getting treated because it lives, you know, it can live outside of the circulatory system. So, and it doesn't need iron, as I mentioned. Uh, and I know a very common thing to do is to use doxycycline uh, which has a very, very low bioavailability in horses. It has to be given twice a day, and it's got to be given for weeks to a month sometimes. And all you have to do is miss one or two doses because you're out to dinner or you're out to movies, and you say, oh, I'm giving all these tablets twice a day. Um, that's enough to throw it into what we call antibiotic stress. Uh, and the organism just gets angry and goes into a biofilm. But it's not actual starvation of the post animal of the horse. Uh, so it's more a form of starvation of the organism. And it's just, it's simply a, a really effective uh, uh, survival method for the organism, which is bad for us because they've really perfected that survival mechanism, unfortunately. Got it. Got it. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, let, let's take a break and uh, switch to, oh, she's got some great questions on there for a little bit. Um, uh, the first one that I see is um, any, any horse with a specific uh, tendon injury, um, what sort of rehabilitation um, would, you, uh, would you suggest to maintain the joint and tendon health um, as well as, as strength and endurance? Is there anything specific? 
for, I'm sorry, the question was about attendance. Um, it says that she has a horse that has a, a superficial tendon okay. Um, okay. injury. Okay, cool. Um, well, as long as the horse is comfortable walking, we walk. And we walk, and as long as the stride length is fine, you know, you want to build that walking up. And, you know, the dream would be to do that three times a day, um, two to three times a day, very controlled. Um, we want to make sure, uh, and, you know, it's a general question that we would try to answer it specifically because I know we were looking for somewhat of a specific answer have to make sure that our interaction with the footing makes sense um so like a lot of horses you want to sort of avoid that deeper footing and if you can't because you're working in it you're up north and you're in an indoor with deep dirt footing um we do need to consider what kind of shoeing we're going to have on that horse a lot of the horses in our rehab we actually try to give them a break from shoes and let them be barefoot for a while um, but we're working on firm rubber surfaces. We're not, there's no sinking in or anything like that. So we do need to address that. And then we just want to keep moving. And then each time before we move, we want to warm up the legs. So doing some range of motion exercises, some warming, um, which is where we use the therapeutic ultrasound. Um, you can, you, you could just warm up the Theragun that I mentioned is something that is kind of like, uh, well, you see, you see it advertised all the time, and it was actually told to me by another veterinarian. Um, he does some work with uh, the one of the sports phys guys for the New York Rangers, where they get hit in the legs with their with hockey pucks, so they get this really dense fibrous tissue that's really painful. So the their gun is kind of sh like a poor man's shockwave almost, and that's a way, a really good way to warm up the tent, warm up that area prior to the work. So we have that elasticity, and then once we're done, we cool it off. Um, but then we also have to think, why did that happen? So that that's an overuse fatigue cycling kind of injury. So I would take a really critical look too at that horse's nutrition and core strength, making sure that it's not carrying around any extra weight. Um, definitely doesn't have an underlying disease to have weaker connective tissue. So again, you know, any sort of metabolic problems. Um, and then just working on the core. So there's um, some really great resources about core exercises. One of them is with Clayton and Stubbs, the How to Activate Your Horse's Core. I, even though I don't get proceeds from that, I mean, I recommend that so much. And there's videos all over the place about that. But in human medicine, it's been shown when they were looking at like Achilles tendon injury, when they had a control group of people that just rested and did some PT and then had a very high re-injury rate versus the people that did Pilates, like specifically Pilates, and then they had a, literally, they dropped the re-injury rate to zero. So can, what can we do to get the horse's core strong? Um, so the Sherpa pads is something that you can do at home. It's pretty tough to screw up the core exercises. I mean, I, I always say for sure, like make sure you're clear to do any of these things by your vet that there's not something else going on. But I think that those just, if you consider those components and taking that aspect of the whole horse um, and then just let, let some time go by, um, that, there's no substitute for that. Because those tissue here in tracks, that's why I put them up there in three different ways. You have to give it enough time. So actually, and I just saw this question kind of dovetails after that one. What's the likelihood of a tender, tendon injury reoccurring um, after proper rehab? Depends on how it healed. Um, so if, some, if you think about something that's like very chronic and just over time, and, over, and horses are masters of laying down scar tissue. All they want to do is replace things with scar tissue. So as they lay down more and more scar tissue, and then that scar tissue rips um, or cracks sometimes is even a better term for it. Um, it's very hard for those edges to come back together completely normally, which is why it's really important to identify these things early before you start letting more and more of those chronic processes go on. So the more chronic it is, the higher your chances of re-injury. Um, and that's why, why younger horses, which tend to do more acute traumatic things, have, yeah, they have a better ability to heal, but they also aren't going through this cycle where they have a ton of scar tissue now that we're just trying to kind of band-aid together in a different way. So I think we, de I mean, we definitely are going to get a re-injury at some point, um, especially if the horse goes back into the exact same program at the exact same level that injured it. Um, so I don't think I'm ever surprised that a horse re-injures. The question is, when does it re-injure? Does it re-injure in five years? Does it re-injure in five months? Does it re-injure in 10 years? Um, does it just injure further up? Um, so those, those factors, 
you just we're just trying to push that out as much as we can. So as long as we can feel confident that we have some of the tissue in there, that's when we want to increase those loads and get back into more specific training and then really be mindful of like how did we wind up there in the first place. I don't know if that answers the question. I hope it does. <laughs> I think you're doing great. You have a whole lot of questions. I'm trying to combine some of them. And um, actually, there's a few that are along the lines of hydrotherapy. So um, I guess first, um, is there any drawbacks to it? Then would you uh, prefer salt water or fresh water or does it matter? So I'm assuming that hydrotherapy, we're talking about like water trembling. Swimming? Um, well, one question was on either swimming or water treadmills, and the other one just said hydrotherapy in general. <laughs> um, so the drawbacks is that, so if it's a soft tissue injury, I don't want to see any black on the ultrasound. Um, so if it's a soft tissue lesion, um, it doesn't go into the water, which is kind of that case that I was showing, like that I was showing that we just, we just weren't ready until we knew what was going on with that tendon. Um, to do that. And then any caveats with uh, the, the water height. So most horses can go into water therapy. Um, the question would be is if it's got a back problem, we want the water lower. If it's got a suspensory problem, we want the water higher. If we're trying to improve range of motion of fetlock joints, we want the water really, really low. Um, Cause that kind of makes the horse like, think about the horse walking through puddles. So it's kind of doing more of this, but that, but that movement could be contraindicated if there's something else going on. And you can also mitigate that with the speed. So I think those things are really important to consider. Um, and obviously any skin issues, so sometimes we just gotta give the horses a break with the water channel because they'll get dermatitis. Um, horses that come up from Wellington, uh, they've got all sorts of skin funks or anywhere in Florida really. I mean, so you have to be careful with any breaks in the skin or if you have any inflammation. The other thing that I tell people is it's gonna really mess with their feet. Uh, because the hook gets really distorted because the water just softens everything. So any abnormal conformation that that hook has, especially the horses that are high-low, um, that can become really gnarly um, as the hook softens. And then horses that we try to keep pads off of them, any sort of frog support, things like that, because all that water just traps underneath there and you get some you can get some nasty thrush. So I'm I'm, care I'm careful in how I apply that. And then I think there was a, one other part. Was it temperature? Uh, salt water or fresh oh, water? Oh, oh, okay. So interestingly, the study that showed, one of the big studies that was originally done looking at buoyancy. Um, so they demonstrated that if you had the water up at these various different levels, you could actually start to float the horse a little bit um, and really remove some of that load. Um, which we would love to be able to do because like in people, you get beautiful healing of really chronic lesions, even after surgery, because the surgeon and PT person will say, don't walk for two weeks. And literally, if you just are non weight bearing for two weeks, you solve 90% of your problems. Because we can't get horses to do that, um, we want to try to float them. Um, so one of the first studies that was done showed this incredible, and I, I think I flipped through it really quickly, but um, uh, that we can get these great buoyancy effects, but they were studying salt water. Um, most water treadmills are not salt water, they're just regular water. Um, one of the big reasons for that is that is a really hard thing to actually maintain. Like maintaining the right levels of salt in a pool like that is a giant pain in the ass, basically. Um, and it's really hard in the equipment. Um, you have the repair guy out all the time. Um, and then what's that secret formula of what the best salt water is? Um, we don't really know, but overall, like I would love it if our all of our treadmills were salt water. The problem is I don't have the time to be like the pool guy every five minutes. So um, so, I, so I think that makes it a little bit trickier. Most of the manufacturers are, they don't make them from salt water. So we do the regular water. Thank you. So we, we, I know we're running a little late, but there's a couple more questions I wanna to get to. I just wanna mention if any, anybody's gonna log off, um, I've been posting a link. I would love it. It's just five questions. It's super quick. If everyone can fill out the evaluation for tonight, um, let us know what you liked, what you learned and what you wanna hear in the future. Cause that's how I, I developed our program for this year was based on last year's surveys. So um, just go ahead and um, take that quick fall check survey. 
Um, but let's take just a few more questions. I know we're not going to get to all of them. And I know Dr. Chrisman worked really hard to answer um, those that came in during and after his talk. So a lot of them are actually for, for Dr. Gold. Um, and there are a few of them on the, um, the Equiband or the Equicore system um, of, of rehabbing or, or strengthening the core. What is your feel along those lines and um, good, bad, otherwise? So we use the Equiband system really have fairly heavily in our rehab programs um, because it's a great way to just just being in a Pilates class where they tell you belly button to spine, belly button to spine, um, and you're just thinking that. So this is actually a way to get a horse to think that. Um, and I know certainly with with our bigger horses, and I when I think of myself as an amateur rider, it's really, really hard to keep a horse engaged and light and engaged the entire ride time. Um, I mean, I have to think about that constantly. Um, and I know, I mean, that's what actually my dressage clients are some of some of our easiest clients to get to rehab because they are so focused on understanding engagement and getting a horse lighten up off its forehand and using its hind end. So the Aquaband, I, I'm not, it, it's not cheating. It's a way to remind the horse to carry itself properly. So we'll start that when they're fairly if they can walk straight on a treadmill and be and walk strong and they are comfortable, we will introduce the Aquaband and then the horse is trained with the Aquaband. We'll actually send the Aquaband home with the horse so it can continue on either be, with, during its hand walks, during its under saddle. But there's really not a downside to it. I mean, I see it a lot down here, just people going on trail rides and just having an Aquaband on their horse and it's not super tight. It's just, again, that reminding the horse your motor is coming from behind you're not supposed to be pulling with your front end you're supposed to be pushing from your hind end and the front end is the landing gear and the steering um so just to if the horse can engage in every step and for those of you who've been lucky enough to sit on a horse that knows how to do that um which is you're really high-end athletes um it's amazing I and mean, you feel them floating and that's because that's what they're doing mm -hmm. so I, i'm a huge fan of those systems and very grateful that they exist especially with my weak legs. So um, I do I do recommend them quite highly. I can second that from the rider standpoint. I'm really glad you recommend them because I, I think they're great as well. I say, can't keep a horse that engaged either. <laughs> a caveat to that is when we first start doing it with the horses in the rehab, um, two of our um, rehab specialists are trained in massage and they can. it's almost like by the book, when we start adding the Aquaband, they start noticing tension in different muscles. So I do think that it is important to kind of know your horse's baseline in terms of how their muscles are. And, um, and certainly consulting with professional massage therapists, body work specialists, things, uh, people in that field and understanding what that baseline is and then how it changes with the understanding that it's going to change. Remember when we're doing that um, growth super compensation curve, there's going to be some pain in the beginning as that changes. So you don't want to do it all day, all the time let it adjust and then it should even back out. But if you keep having pain with applying that, then you probably need to get something checked out. You may need to get something checked out because um, you certainly don't want to be pissing off a back or SI or something um, when you're trying to do good. Excellent. Well, um, hopefully this one will be uh, the last brief question, but I do see there's a couple very specific questions. And I know you mentioned that it was okay if people contacted you about something very specific. So if I don't get to your very specific question, um, you know, please, I'll, I'll pop your email if you don't mind in, in the chat again while you're answering this last question. But um, the last one is um, just very generally, are, are injuries typically from use or can they also be from footing? And what do we need to be concerned about there with footing, different types of footing? I think, well, I don't think it's one more than the other. I think in in sport horses, it's chronic repetitive overuse injury. So it's an inappropriate response to the applied forces. So if those forces are dealing with footing that's too deep, when the job is to spring up into the air, then you're going to have this repetitive traumatic cycle. Um, if your job is to slide through the dirt, um, like a rainer, um, then if you had a different sort of footing, um, and I know this because the horse that I bought is a rainer, and there's one of the first things I did was jump on him and try to run and make him stop real quick. 
And as I'm about to ask him to stop, and I'm in my uh, trainer's very fancy footing, or like the artificial footing that is in all the jumping surfaces here. And as I'm about to stop, tell him to, whoa, my trainer's like, don't do that in that footing. Because one, I'm going to strip it down to the base and it's really expensive. And two, yeah, I mean, he couldn't stop because it just, as soon as he went into the slide, he stopped. And I'm lucky that his stifles, I didn't leave his stifles in the back corner. Um, and he just very kindly hopped and I was like, okay, that was a really, really bad idea. So the, the surface needs to be appropriate for the work that you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to wind up in that situation. It's also important to cross train on different surfaces, right? So the body adapts to different stimulations. So being able to try to do different things. But on the, I guess another way to answer that would be is if you have, say, a soft tissue injury, avoid competing or overtraining on days where the footing's not great. Are not ideal if it's too deep it's too slippery the horse is going to have too many weird unorganized movement um then you want to have a surface that's much more predictable and giving and then how the shoeing inter or the foot if it has shoes on interacts with those surfaces um can help you or hurt you so it's it's really tailored to the sport um and then what you have available to you and yes there's always like the perfect combination of what it is that you want for that particular athlete um, but there's also a reality of this is where your horse lives and this is the type of footings that, that, that's at that place. And this is the level that, and then this farrier does this. Um, so you have to come up with a program that will work and you can come up with that because there's a whole bunch of different ways to skin that cat. Um, but there's, there's just some basic principles about it that you just think about. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, we still have over 100 people hanging out with us, even though I know I ran a little bit late, but um, there were such great questions. I hated to, to cut everybody off, but um, I think we are going to call it good there with questions. So thank you for spending um, your, your Tuesday afternoon with us. Let's, um, I guess, give a big virtual round of applause. And again, that's what I, uh, I always seem to hate the virtual because you never, you don't get to hear that, that loud round of applause and the thank you and see people's faces. But um, but thank you guys very much. Um, for those of you who are on, I posted the link to the survey. You can please take that. Um, we also um, will be recording these or are recording these webinars. Um, when all is done, um, probably later in March, we're going to be posting them on our Equine Science Center YouTube page and we'll let everybody know when they are. So if you enjoyed it and you have someone um, that might not have been there or who you want to listen to certain things or or the talks, um, you can get them to listen to them after, after the fact. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you again to our speakers. Thank you, Zoetis. Thank you, uh, BW Furlong, for, um, for supporting you guys um, and for donating your time for us today. Thank you again. And thank you, all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you, guys.